Uh, great. Uh, so, yeah, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, how we can try to leverage physics information in neural networks, uh, specifically looking at fluid flow problems. Um, and my talk is uh, in two um, two parts. The first part is work that I did at Stanford um, as, as part of my PhD. And the second second part is work that I've been doing more recently at NVIDIA. Um, so um, turbulence uh, is is ubiquitous, right? And a lot of climate um, applications and engineering applications involving fluid flows as well. Um, and the, the challenge with being able to simulate turbulent flows is that there's these huge range of scales. Um, so in an atmospheric boundary layer, for example, uh, you go from uh, a kilometer, order of a kilometer to, uh, to a few millimeters uh, from the largest to the smallest scales. And it's really infeasible to, uh, to simulate all of that from in first principles. Right. Um, so um, the problem that, uh, that we were looking at is this uh, problem of turbulence enrichment. Um, essentially, the idea is if, you're, if you have a low resolution field, um, like this one on the left, uh, this could be uh, either from a large eddy simulation, LES, or it could be from experiment experimental measurements where uh, you don't have access to the finer scales because of, um, because of uh, time resolution limits or spatial resolution limits. Um, and can you recover um, a statistically um, similar high resolution field? Um, so so uh, that, that's the overall problem that we're trying to address. Um, and this has been uh, this has been done in the past um, through traditional uh, physics based uh, methods uh, under the umbrella of kinematic simulation. Um, but the, the what we are trying to do is see if we can do this in a in a more um, uh, deep learning kind of approach. Um, so the choice of neural networks that we're using here is uh, a generator, uh, generative adversarial networks. Uh, in case you're not very familiar with this, um, the idea is to have two networks, a generator and a, uh, and a discriminator network. The generator takes in uh, some input. Uh, in our case, would be the low resolution field and would uh, output uh, a high resolution field. Uh, and the discriminator network takes in either a, a real high resolution data sample or a gener generated high resolution data sample. And its job is to predict the probability that that sample given that, that it's given is real or fake, um, and so this is this game theoretic approach of training these networks where um, the optimal solution is when the generator is so good that the discriminator can't distinguish between real and, and the generated data. Um, so, so the the problem that uh, we're looking at is, um, or, or the data set that we're looking at is the simplest turbulence flow field that you can imagine, which is. Uh, homogeneous isotropic turbulence. It's a 3D periodic box with some uh, forcing inside to to um, to generate these turbulent structures. Um, so um, we're, we're using a 64 by 64 by 64 grid, um, and you have four fields: a velocity, three velocity fields, and a pressure field. And the low resolution data is then generated by filtering that that those high resolution fields and downsampling them by 4x to get a 16 by 16 by 16, um, 16 grid. And I have to say here that all of this work is uh, fairly low Reynolds numbers um, just to keep the computational costs uh, manageable. Um, so a, a lot of this work is inspired by this, this uh, previous work called uh, SRGAN, which is super resolution generative adversarial networks. Uh, where the idea is to look at um, to take images and super res, super res them, right? And this works uh, really well for images. Uh, they've compared with bicubic and some other uh, methods in in their paper. Um, and, and what we're trying to do here is um, take some take an idea like this and see if we can adapt it to the physics uh, domain. Um, I don't want to spend too much time talking about the architectures. Essentially, we have ResNet-like uh, convolutional layers. The generator takes in the low-resolution data set, goes through a few convolution layers, get a high-resolution data set at the out out output layer. And the discriminator takes either a real or a generated high-resolution um, data sample, uh, a few convolution layers, and predicts the probability of it being real or fake. Um, 
So the, the difference between physics data and images is that uh, for physics data, you really have to respect conservation laws, right? That is, that's of utmost importance. Um, so in, in our case, um, the governing equations are the Navier-Stokes equations. So you have continuity and momentum equations, uh, and we're not using any time dynamics here. So um, we can reformulate the governing equations as the continuity equation, which is conservation of mass. And you can use momentum and continuity to get this pressure pressure Poisson equation. Um, and then the, for for the generated data that the that the model generates, you can then compute uh, residuals of these equations um, and integrate in the integrate them in the in the field uh, and that and add them to the losses. Um, so uh, essentially, you're penalizing the generator for uh, not satisfying satisfying physics. And you you can think of this in a couple of different ways. Um, I think the uh, uh, the most intuitive way to think of this is a is as a regularizer. So if you have a space of all possible models uh, and a manifold in that uh, in that space is uh, the manifold of physically realizable models, what you're doing with this physics uh, losses is to pull that that model down to this to this manifold. So you so you're respecting uh, the governing equations. Um, in terms of the losses, there's, there's a lot of losses here because we have the adversarial components and then we have the physics losses. Then we also have the com uh, content losses. And uh, the one thing I want to call out is we have the standard mean squared error, which is uh, what is typically used. But we also add an entropy component to the, to the content loss just to sensitize the model to um, the high frequency uh, details. Um, Okay, so here, here's a few lot loss plots um, for um, different values of uh, lambda p, which is the weighting for the physics losses. So going from z zero, which is no physics loss, to 0.5, where, which is a high uh, weighting for the physics losses, you can see that the um, that the physics losses drop by more than an order of magnitude, um, which means that the generated data is satisfying physics much better. Uh, one interesting thing here is that as you increase the physics losses, um, there is a strong attractor at the trivial solution. So the Navier-Stokes equation satisfies zero velocities and pressure as, as a solution, right? Um, so um, the, with, with very high physics losses, the network uh, tries to converge to that trivial solution. Uh, and we found that we'd had to use a, a, a few tricks, uh, including higher learning rates and momentum parameters to be able to get out of that, uh, out of that local minimum and converge to the, the true solution. Um, yeah, so here, here are a few, uh, a few plots of the low, of low resolution and high resolution fields. Um, and we're comparing um, TE GAN, which is turbulence enrichment GAN, which is the model that I just described. Uh, we can also have just the generator without training, uh, without the discriminator component. And we're calling that TE ResNet and comparing that against bicubic interpolation. So bicubic here is a very smeared version of this high resolution data field, as you'd expect. Um, but the TE GAN model is able to get capture much more of the fine scale structures in the high resolution fields. Um, more quantitatively, if you look at um, content and physics losses uh, and compare the GAN versus just the ResNet uh, model, you see that the GAN outperforms the ResNet in in, in all of the metrics. Um, but most importantly, um, in the physics losses, um, when you go to the test set, uh, the, the GAN helps it generalize much better. To data that it's that it that is unseen, and you see a pretty uh, significant difference between the, the ResNet and the GAN um, in in terms of physics compatibility. Um, uh, we wanted to talk a little bit about some some statistical uh, metrics of the flow fields. Um, so here I'm showing the energy spectrum. So, so the black is the high resolution field, um, the, the ground truth, if you will. And the red is the low resolution filtered down fields. Right? If you use bicubic interpolation, you kind of uh, you you expand the spectrum, but don't really recover all of the energy containing uh, scales. But with the TE GAN model, you're able to really um, capture all of the energy containing uh, scales pretty well. There is a discre discrepancy at the most dissipative scales, uh, uh, but in terms of energy quantities, um, it, it performs uh, pretty well. Um, okay, we also look at uh, second order two point correlations. This is essentially another metric that shows the energy distribution as a function of, uh, of uh, physical scale. Um, and here, if you look at the bicubic interpolation, you see that it's just interpolating the low resolution uh, statistics. 
uh, but the TE GAN is really able to recover the high resolution uh, fields. And um, what this means is that uh, the TE GAN model is able to recover the energy of the, of, of the system uh, pretty accurately. Um, what's more interesting is if you look at these third third order uh, two point correlations, which uh, which are an indicator of energy dynamics of how energy transfer happens between scales, um, and this is something that traditional kinematic simulation methods uh, don't do a don't do a great job typically uh, at, um, and the TE GAN model here qualitatively captures uh, the trends of the high resolution field and quantitatively is about uh, fifteen percent off. Um, but but this is this is interesting because uh, this is something that the TE GAN model is not exposed to directly, but it's uh, it's something that it has to learn because it is uh, physics aware. Um, and and finally, we can look at flow morphology. There's this uh, in turbulence field uh, flow. There's this concept of a QR diagram. I won't go into too many details about this, but. Uh, again, the TE GAN model is able to more faithfully recover the, the high resolution fields, and um, this this classic teardrop shape is is uh, that's classic to turbulent flows is is uh, recovered much better by the TE GAN model. Um, and I, I wanted to acknowledge some of my authors in this work: um, Manlong, Ronak, Shravya, and Sanjeev Lele. Um, um, and then uh, move to the second portion of the talk, which is about uh, physics-informed neural networks and the work we've been doing in that space at NVIDIA. And this is work that's um, done, uh, that's being put together as a part of a toolkit called SimNet, if, uh, if that's interesting to anybody in the audience. Um, so everything that I spoke about so far has been um, in the discrete domain. Right? We had discrete points, uh, convolutional layers, which are all discrete. Um, here, we're trying to see how we can um, get away with the with that with, with with that aspect of um, physics informed neural networks and uh, um, the way the way that uh, you can do that is um, to uh, solve to use neural networks as a solver uh, in some sense um, so here we have this example which is a lid driven cavity flow um, and what you want any solver to do is essentially create a mapping between your spatial coordinates x and y uh, and the fields of, of interest. Right? So that would be velocities, u, v, and the pressure p. Um, so with a neural network, what you can do is create uh, a, new, uh, a neural network that takes an x and y as the input uh, at the input layer and outputs u, v, p at the output layer. Um, and that function represented by the neural network, uh, let's call that u net. Um, and we want this function to essentially satisfy all of our governing equations. So that would be uh, continuity and the momentum equations. Um, so if you, if you uh, look at a more simple example, uh, here we're looking at a 1D Poisson equation. Um, you have the second derivative of um, scalar u with respect to x, uh, and that's equal to some forcing function f. And then you have some boundary conditions um, at uh, your domain boundaries at 0 and 1. Right? So again, we can create a, a network that takes in x, outputs u, um, and then uh, we can then create um, losses that essentially um, penalize penalize the network for not satisfying boundary conditions, which is which is easy because we have Dirichlet boundary conditions in this case. Um, and then for the governing equations, we can use automatic differentiation um, or backpropagation um, to compute the derivatives of this network uh, u net uh, with respect to the input coordinate x. Uh, and once you have the gradients, you can then construct the residuals of your governing equations and add them as your as a as another component of your loss. Um, so essentially, what you're doing here is you're training the network directly on on the governing equations and and without any additional data. So um, if you compare it with a traditional um, uh, deep learning method, the the data samples are just sampled points in your domain, uh, sample coordinates, uh, and the labels are uh, are just zero because the governing equation residues should be zero. Right? Um, so for this 1D problem, if you if you use this method to solve the problem, um, this is the result that you get. The orange line is the exact solution, and the blue line, which is behind this orange line, is the neural network solution, and it's uh, virtually a, a perfect match. Um, so in, in a more general setting, you can have other input um, parameters, uh, in this case, x, y, z coordinates, maybe a time 
uh, time as well as an input, and you can have other parameterizations as well. This goes through a, a few hidden layers, and you get the output layer, which uh, for fluid flow would be velocities and pressure. And then to construct the PDE losses, you can take derivatives of, of this network. Uh, so the derivatives of the output with respect to the input, and that will stack on to the end of your, uh, of your model. And then finally, you can then construct the PDE losses, boundary conditions, uh, uh, initial conditions if you have uh, a time-dependent problem. And um, you can also add uh, data from either a higher fidelity uh, solution or uh, better modeling or experimental data, and then convert this into a data assimilation problem. Um, so this, this opens up a few different uh, interesting, uh, interesting opportunities. Um, so going back to that, to the Poisson equation problem, uh, we can also solve inverse problems. So let's say we have the solution uh, u true. Um, this is the true solution at 100 random points. Um, but we don't know what the forcing function is that is, that is driving the solution. Right? So we can then um, construct a network that outputs um, uh, the solution u and, and the forcing function f. And we create the residual, uh, the governing equation losses just, just, this layer, just as I described earlier. But then we also add another data loss where you're essentially enforcing that the neural network solution has to has to be equal um, to the true solution at those sample points. Um, and if you do this for 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 this one D example, on the right is is the uh, is the solution U. Uh, the blue crosses are the sample points where we know the true solution, and the orange line is 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 the neural network solution. Um, and on the left is is the forcing function uh, again um, orange is um, orange here is the true true solution and blue is the is the inverted uh, forcing function and you see that in the interior of the domain we see pretty good pretty good match but close to the boundaries there's some there's some discrepancy but then because uh, we're using dirichlet boundary conditions so uh, the sensitivity of the solution to the forcing function close to the boundaries is is lower um, another interesting thing we can do with this with this uh, approach is to solve parameterized PDEs. So again, if you look at that 1D example, we have the Poisson equation, uh, and then we have boundary conditions. Previously, we had the boundary condition at uh, uh, x equal to 0 and x equal to 1. But if we want to parameterize our, our, our domain and say that goes from 0 to L, where L lies between 1 and 2, we can now train a neural network that takes in x and this parameter L. Um, and predicts a u, right? And then we create the residuals uh, and the boundary conditions and everything just like before. Uh, the only difference is that instead of sampling just x values, we sample um, a combination of x and l values and train the network on that. Uh, uh, the this uh, what this does is it allows us to train a, the solution to this parameterized problem in in one shot. So essentially, in one training pass. You learn the solution for all all values of the of this parameter l that you uh, that you included in your training uh, routines, um, and and here's the solution. So for for different values of l, you see you can see different um, these different lines uh, corresponding to um, solutions for different l values, uh, and you can imagine how this would be useful in uh, in like parametric optimization, for example. Um, so I wanted to quickly show some results that we uh, for 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 fluid uh, flow problems. So here is a lid driven cavity. This is just a standard forward solution compared with um, an open foam solution, and we see uh, we can get pretty close, pretty good results uh, with less than one percent difference between the two solutions. Um, and um, can also solve inverse problems. Uh, so this is a, a heat sink. Um, where we have uh, a few points where we know the the velocity and and temperature values, uh, but we don't know the kinematic viscosity and the thermal diffusivity of, of this fluid. Um, so we can use this inverse uh, problem approach to back out those values. And again, when you compare them with the true solution, they they're pretty pretty close. Um, um, we've also done this uh, this problem. Uh, for, which is a which is uh, an aneurysm, and this is an, uh, a data assimilation problem. Essentially, we have this aneurysm geometry, um, and there's some concentration uh, a dye that's introduced um, here at the inlet, and we have the concentration values for that dye as a function of time. 
but we don't know what the velocities and pressures are. Uh, so we can do the same inverse problem uh, kind of approach to back out the pressures. Um, and because this is a complex geometry, sampling and things are a little more complicated. Uh, and we have um, some interesting met methods to use uh, ray tracing hardware on, on uh, the newer generation of GPUs uh, to do that more efficiently. Um, and when you compare uh, the solution that we get with OpenFOAM and another uh, solver called Net Nectar++, you see uh, the errors are pretty small. One interesting thing here is that we weren't able to get the errors to go below uh, about half a percent or so um, uh, when we compared with OpenFOAM. Uh, but then when we move to Nectar++, which is a much higher fidelity solver, higher order um, finite element uh, code, then we were able to really um, get much better comparisons, uh, suggesting that maybe there was an issue with the open foam solver or, uh, or the grid generation process for this, for this complex geometry. Um, and um, another problem that we've looked at is the heat sink. This is one of the heat sinks for an, for an NVIDIA GPU. Um, and this is a multi-physics problem where we're doing fluid flow plus heat transfer uh, in a coupled way. Uh, and you see that the temperatures and pressure drops compare very well with, uh, with a commercial solver. Um, what's more interesting is you can do this in a parameterized way. So you, we can parameterize this heat sink geometry with a bunch of parameters. Here we have 10 different parameters um, looking at the lengths of uh, the the four, uh, four front of the fins and the back of the fins, some trim angles and so on. And we can train a solution for this in, in essentially one shot. So with SimNet, that takes about a thousand uh, GPU hours. Uh, and then we can do some parametric uh, optimization uh, to generate this bottom, uh, this, this geometry, which is the optimal, optimal geometry. Um, and if you were to do this with uh, a traditional solver, let's say open form, We'd need um, about 60,000 separate runs for each parameter value, and that would total to 18.4 million CPU hours. Um, but because we're able to train the solution in one shot for all of these parameters, uh, it becomes much more efficient to do that in in in, in Subnet. Um, and and also intuitively, this this design makes a lot of sense, right? Um, you have fins at the top, um, where where you, these fins get get cold air and so cool more efficiently but then the the hot air that comes out of that is not used to cool any of the any of the back uh, heat pipes and um, the the fins at the back heat pipes are uh, are located in a, in a in a region where they get more clear access to cold air coming from the inlet so, so even intuitively that this optimal geometry makes a lot of sense all right, uh, with that I just want to uh, mention my co-authors for this this uh, work, and if we have time, I'd be happy to take questions.